Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this Friday for the grand finale of An Evening with Neuroscience 2021. I'm Jay. And I'm Chloe. And we're your event coordinators this year from Gray Matters. It's an honor to be hosting you, especially those of you who are tuning in from far away. And we look forward to spending time with you in an energetic evening. Gray Matters Journal began at the University of Washington as the first undergraduate neuroscience journal in the state and one of the first in the nation, producing scientific journalism of the highest quality. It is founded on the core belief that neuroscience education should be accessible to everyone, regardless of background. Since our founding, we have worked with over 900 undergraduate students at three universities to produce over 250 articles in 24 issues that are available online. In addition, for the past six years, Gray Matters has annually hosted an Evening with Neuroscience, an informal, exciting way to engage with members of the neuroscience field about the most thought-provoking questions and cutting-edge technology around the world. Our event consists of one hour of discussions on questions you pre-submitted these past four weeks, and after a 10-minute intermission, one hour of live Q&A with our six distinguished panelists about your most stimulating questions. This year, we're overjoyed to host an exceptional group of six members of the neuroscience community. Dr. Zin Kang, our moderator, Dr. Adrian Fairhall, Dr. Tara Wanger, Dr. Aaron Klein, Dr. Tom Daniel, and Dr. Sarah Bo Miller. As always, our panel is full of interdisciplinary backgrounds, ranging from basic science to surgery, to ethics, to tech, engineering, and computational neuroscience. It's time to turn it over to our wonderful panelists. Let the brains begin. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Zin Kine. I'm a neuroscientist, uh, obviously, and I have a PhD in cellular, molecular, and developmental neuroscience. And I study, um, currently, I study the spinal cord injury and how uh, our nervous system is very plastic and how we can repair uh, the central nervous system using that spinal cord injury model. Um, I'm originally from Burma, and I immigrated here to the States uh, after finishing high school. And uh, that's just a little bit about myself. Good evening, uh, I'm Tom Daniel. Uh, and thanks to Chloe, uh, Jay and Hayden. This is a really exciting event. I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, my background is a combination of biology and engineering. And I would consider myself in the domain of neuroengineering, that interface of neuroscience and engineering technologies. I'm particularly interested in movement and movement control and um, both devices to understand it as well as just the basic principles. I use uh, model systems. I actually use insect model systems to study this. And um, my training, as I said, is both engineering and, and biology. And I also thoroughly enjoy collaborating with computational neuroscientists such as Adrian and others. And um, it's just a really exciting time in neuroscience. And so welcome and thanks. It's great to be here. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Baumiller. Um, my background is also in neuroscience. I got my PhD at the University of Texas in Houston um, using neuroimaging to look at uh, multisensory processing, mostly multisensory processing and speech. Um, but then after two postdocs, one at Vanderbilt and then one at the University of Washington, uh, a little less than two years ago, I actually made the jump to industry. And now I'm a quantitative user experience researcher at Google. Um, and on the product team that I'm on, I help them make data-driven decisions, uh, trying to figure out what kind of questions we should ask, uh, sort of understand how users feel and, and act um, with our product um, and making sure the team has the right data um, and is interpreting the data well um, so we can really understand uh, our users well. Hi, I'm Tara Wanger. I am an associate professor in the division of genetic medicine and clinically, I'm the Associate Medical Director for Inpatient Genetics at Seattle Children's Hospital. Um, I got my MD-PhD at the University of Rochester. My PhD and early work was focused on autism and neurodevelopmental disorders. And after medical school, I did my residency in pediatrics and medical genetics fellowship at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. My work over time has evolved into more of a focus on improving outcomes through rapid diagnosis and precision therapeutics, which have really been evolving and uh, making huge gains over the last uh, years and even months and weeks. I love being at the intersection of clinical care and new research because it's an exciting, it's really exciting in real time to be involved in bringing hope to children and families who are affected by genetic diseases, even for diseases that have historically had universally poor outcomes. Um, there are new therapies every day. So it's truly an honor to be invited to participate in this panel tonight. Yeah, thanks to the organizers also for the chance to talk to you all today. So I'm a professor in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics. I'm also director of a computational neuroscience center here at UW. Um, my background, though, is in physics. My PhD is in theoretical physics. And then I uh, moved into neuroscience only through my postdoc. I grew up in Australia, and I did my graduate school uh, in Israel, which was really the place where I learned uh, how closely entwined uh, ideas from computer science and physics were with, with neuroscience. And that's really what got me excited about, about moving into this area. So my own lab uh, mainly builds mathematical models of different kinds of brain circuits and functions. We work on pretty much every system we can get our hands on. We've worked on um, how single neurons uh, transform information from inputs to outputs. We've worked with Tom on trying to analyze the sensory coding of various little components of, of insect um, sensory systems. Uh, we work on hydro, which is a tiny little transparent jellyfish. And we even work on on primates, we try to understand how, how monkeys implement decision-making and how they learn. So pretty much everything we can uh, contribute to, we like to. Thank you. Hi, I'm Aaron Klein. Um, really happy to be here and I uh, wanna thank the organizers too. Um, I'm, a, I'm a neurologist at uh, Oregon Health and Science University in Portland and a philosopher in the philosophy department at the University of Washington and the Center for Neurotechnology at the University of Washington. Um, I work primarily in the field of neuroethics, which is um, kind of an offshoot of bioethics or medical ethics, but focus primarily on topics related to neuroscience, neurology, psychiatry. Um, sort of within neuroethics, I focus on social and ethical implications of developments in neurotechnology. So, um, and you know, I find this interesting because it's it sort of um, sits at the intersection of some remarkable discoveries in, in neuroscience, um, illness, medicine, and, and sort of changes um, in society. So, um, uh, so I'm really happy to be here, thank you. Well, thank you so much for introducing yourselves. Uh, I think, feel like I need to type a few questions myself. So I hope the audience, you're thinking of all the amazing questions that you can ask uh, and on the second half of uh, our, our evening. So the very first question that we have um, is, what is the contribution of your field to the way that we understand the brain as a whole? What approaches uh, did it take and why was it necessary? Um, I think I'll start with Dr. Uh, Adrian. Yeah, I'd love to answer that because I think that over the last um, 10 years, 
my area, computational neuroscience has really moved from being something that's always been part of neuroscience, but has become more and more central. And that's partly because there's been just a tremendous advance in, in technologies for recording the brain over the past little while. We used to do experiments by threading an electrode into the brain that would, would record from one neuron and we would look at what that neuron does. Now we can routinely characterize and record from thousands of neurons simultaneously. And so a huge amount of data that's super complicated. And so in order to be able to interpret what that data is telling us, we need a, a really good statistics, right? To figure out what is, what is even going on in all that data. And then theory to understand what that can tell us about how brains are actually working, right? What kinds of algorithms are being implemented by this sort of stream of, of spiking activity that we're able to record. And so theory and, and data analysis have really become a critical piece of, of a lot of neuroscience in the, in, the last, in the last few years. So, you know, that's, that's what my field tries to do, tries to propose ideas about how brains might work to implement those ideas in terms of models and then to develop data analysis techniques so that when we record from brains, we can try to map um, those recordings onto our, our theories of the brain. Anyone else want to take a, take a stab at there? That's very interesting. The other panelists would like to weigh in on their contribution and how how their studies really contribute to understanding of neuroscience. I'll just pull on the thread that Adrian started, which is we're at a really at a turning point in neuroscience. There's this emergence of amazing technologies and advances, actually in several areas. What she mentioned was we can record from neurons and millions or many at the same time, sometimes electrically, sometimes optically. Um, it's the cusp of genetic engineering tools that are allowing us to see some of these things optically, but also to modify circuits. So you have technological innovations, you have genetic innovations happening, and, and you also have uh, sort of the computational innovations that are needed given all of the data that's flowing in. And, and our lab is really dependent on, on a lot of this. And in fact, we even need machine vision. So once you're recording from all the electrical activities, you know, creatures are doing stuff. You're moving your hands or somehow your muscles and body is moving in space. And we need to be able to document the sort of subtleties of that. So Adrian, spot on, you know, it's, it's this confluence of advances in technologies that's really driving neuroscience forward. But I think the only other thing I would add is that neuroscience is driving the advent of new technology. I think I might also add that, you know, in my own work where we're looking at spinal cord injury, uh, we are also are looking at actually just blood flow inside the spinal cord itself, right? So as neuroscientists, I was always really focused on neurons and glia cells, what the cells of the nervous system are doing. But in fact, you can't really do much of anything if you don't have blood flow. <laughs> so, you know, in an injury model that I study, and now you really bring in uh, imaging technologies that really look at blood flow. And the blood flow, of course, matters a lot whether or not your brain cells are alive. Certainly after spinal cord injury, we might have a contusion or something like that, that, you know, presses on the spinal cord that limits blood flow. And, and really just by seeing, you can also diagnose. You know, we, we, we look at spinal cord injury, for example, and then we can look at neurological testing is what, what people normally do in the clinic. But with advances in imaging technologies, you can actually maybe see cells that are at risk for death before they die. So you might be able to rescue some of those cells and neurons. So that's very exciting. And in addition, because we're looking at imaging, let's say, you know, the ultrasound imaging I do currently is like 10,000 frames a second. So that's a lot of data that I'm not used to. Usually I look at cells under the microscope, you know, they don't really move very much at all and I can count them. You know, there are very various techniques to really address what you're seeing and, and how to process that data. So again, the sort of uh, emergence of innovations in imaging, really needing computational power and statistics to really understand what we're seeing. So it is very exciting times um, indeed. Anyone else wanted to add to that before we move to the next question? And I'll just jump onto what you said there. 
I think that it's really interesting that you highlight not just the technological advances, but I think that there's been a huge advancement in terms of our understanding why overlap with other fields is important and affects the brain and that it's not just neurons and glia in isolation acting together, but that really you have to take into account the whole system. Um, one of the things that I've worked on is in what, uh, what I consider surgical genetics, which seems like a misnomer, but it's it's really a thing. Um, and there's a there's a, a group of, of children with a genetic condition that includes significant neurodevelopmental disability, and they also have problems with the way that their skull fuses together. So it fuses together too early, and there isn't enough space in their brain to grow in the appropriate way. And what we found by learning from our patients and learning not just which patients aren't, haven't done as well, but which patients have really just blown us out of the water with expectations and found that really making sure that, that, that the skull is, is being made bigger at the appropriate times in development has allowed for a group of kids in, in this particular disorder from being nonverbal, no one speaks, no one talks, no one walks to, you know, graduation speaker at eighth grade graduation, honors classes, you know, all of these things. And, and I think that we, we used to think that this was probably a genetic effect on the brain itself. And now we've learned that, the, that that's just probably not the most important part of the story. So just like you say, blood flow, your brain has to have a place, it's, it's sitting in a skull um, that also has to grow to make room for it. And there are dynamic changes over time. So I think that that's another advance um, in our understanding, not just technology, but also our appreciation that there are other factors that affect the way that the brain can develop and grow. And with that, there's opportunity to intervene and to make sure that, that that's optimized. So that really brings up to uh, the next question we had really nicely, actually. So where do you encounter interdisciplinary topics uh, from other fields like your own? So I, I just talked about, you know, imaging blood flow uh, for a neuroscientist, it was like, whoa, what was I doing? You know, I should be looking at neurons. So, so that's really important, right? And where do you find that technology and the, the, the interdisciplinary topic? And what are some of your favorite intersections uh, between neuroscience and other fields? And why do you find them fascinating? Uh, Aaron, uh, would you like to get started on that? Um, sure. So, uh... So you know, when, when we think of interdisciplinarity, we, we can think about that between scientific fields, but also between um, science and, and the humanities. And so you know, I think it's, it's possible for, for ethicists or in, in, um, people in the humanities and scientists to kind of go about their work in relative independence from each other, but um, in separate silos, you know, um, so to speak. Um, but I think you know, this, this misses a tremendous opportunity uh, because um, you know, unless people are talking with one another, uh, another, they can't learn from one another. So, you know, and specifically when we think about um, philosophers and ethicists, you know, contemplating the social and ethical implications of, of developments in neuroscience, and um, it really it really helps to 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 work with people in 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 the neuroscience field fields in order to have a kind of a, a finger on the developments that are happening. Um, and in part, in part, I think that's import, important because um, otherwise um, you end up with uh, philosophers and ethicists who are kind of engaging in more speculation, hypothetical science fiction um, without really um, understanding where the science is and, and, and where it's going. So, um, um, so, so I think that's just, just sort of a, a plug for the importance of interdisciplinarity across um, science and and uh, and non-science fields. Sarah, do you want to comment on how sort of neuroscience and technology? When I when I saw that you were on the panel and learn about what you were doing, I was like, wow, I really need to talk to her. Um, it seems really interesting, uh, you know, from going from academia to industry and how you're contributing as a neuroscientist uh, to this whole process of user experience. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, the, the kinds of experiments and, and studies that I run um, are very different these days. There's, there's much less that is controlled. A lot of times I'm trying to kind of reach people where they're at and so they're not in a lab. I can't really narrow down variables the same way that you know I could before and you're not always looking at um, 
can I prove the, the underlying theory necessarily, but kind of can I figure out how to make this problem work? Um, but I do kind of take a lot with me um, in what I was working on, I was looking at a lot of like perception and how to, that's kind of what you're like, what you've sort of built up in your life and your experience um, that impact how you kind of take in new information um, and, and things like that, different kind of models that I was using um, when I was in academia. And I kind of used that kind of thinking to try and break down what might be happening uh, when users are misunderstanding something um, or they're kind of taking it in a totally different direction and trying to like figure out like, what are the contexts um, that we need to understand? Uh, you know, not everybody is, um, you know, has a, a super premium smartphone in a really high tech area. There's all these other factors that might kind of influence how they read, for example, the exact same sentence. Um, and so trying to make sure that people understand things and, and sort of all the different things that can impact that. Um, so it's not as kind of precise um, as some of the more controlled experiments I used to have where you can kind of really, you know, pair, you know, kind of systematically go through all these different things and I could vary all the levels of every variable um, in a really precise way. But I still kind of take that kind of thinking with me and trying to kind of break down how I want to approach the experiment, how I want to ask the questions um, and also how I kind of think about the data analysis um, so I can still kind of try to get at some of the things that are kind of underlying uh, behavior that sometimes looks uh, way differently than we expect to uh, when we kind of start. That's super exciting. Um, all right, uh, moving right along. Um, let's see. So as the field of neuroscience advances into the 21st century, what are some major ideas uh, or assumptions about the nervous system that are being questions, questioned or corrected. Anyone want to take a stab at that first? I'll take a stab because it kind of came up in a bit of the discussion that we started with that, you know, even now recording technologies are letting us look at so many neurons at the same time. You know, some of the classic findings in neuroscience involve what's called a tuning curve, right? You put a an electrode in a neuron, it, it, it spikes away, you know, it gives neural activity, you vary something in the world and you kind of trace out how many spikes does a given input, you know, make that neuron fire. And that's been a super powerful way to think about characterizing neural function or what we call neural coding, right? How do neurons encode information? But as we record for more and more neurons, we realize that that's a pretty impoverished picture. <laughs> it's very hard to put it together, you know, the whole thing, if we really have to understand neuron by neuron what they encode. And so the way the field has really moved is to think about neurons, not as individual neurons doing something particular, but as a whole ensemble, right? As a network with, you know, with activity patterns that are kind of constructed by that whole network. And where there's really, really exciting, sort of going back to the question of interdisciplinarity right now, uh, is that at the same time that we are trying to figure out what neurons are doing through these amazing recordings, the field of, of you know, computer science are charging ahead with building artificial neural networks that are sort of based on the principles behind you know, real brain neural networks. And they are making incredible progress in how well um, artificial neural networks are able to do tasks that we previously thought were really only able to be done by, by human brains. And so there's an incredibly tight dialogue between the developments in engineering around how Google are building their you know, language processors and what we're discovering about brains. And we, we need to learn from each other all the time because if you build a network and it can do something, you have to you know, put in some architecture or learn some architecture, then we can ask as neuroscientists, well, does that, is that giving us any hint about how the brain might work? And at the same time, we see things that brains do that aren't currently built into neural networks. You know, we have neuro, neuromodulators, right? We have chemicals that swoosh through our brain and affect the way all the neurons in the brain are, are functioning that kind of switch, right? The dynamics of our, of our nervous system. You, you get a boost of dopamine, you feel better, right? You, there are chemicals that kind of control your mood and, your, and your, um, the way you, you look at the world. And that's not part of a, of a neural network, right? So can we figure out what those neuromodulators are doing for our brains to help us better build um, artificial neural networks that instantiate some of those, some of those principles?
Uh, the other thing that I was going to add, actually, you know, this might be a bit of old news, but, you know, the idea that uh, your brain cells are still growing, right, as an adult mammalian system, it's also a really new advance, I think, in the last few decades. We used to understand that our brain was a terminally differentiated organ. That is to say, you know, you're going to have all the neurons that you're ever going to have, and that's it. So, you know, if you lose them, uh, uh, you can't replace them. And so that that's really, that's one of those uh, canonical th uh, ideas in neuroscience that's been upended, right? And, and yet that was, that happened like three decades ago where we found, you know, cells that are dividing inside human and non-human primate brains. And yet we still don't understand what those new neurons are doing. Um, so there's a lot to sort of understand. And from my perspective, you know, who's someone who's really interested in the plasticity of the adult central nervous system and how how plastic we are and as we age you know where i'm really interested in how i can learn new things for example it's still amazing even without injury you know we can learn lots of new things or after injury our brain can have very plastic uh changes right uh when I say plastic, like you can learn new things or different connections can be made. Um, that's amazing. But, and yet we, like I said, we, we know now in specific parts of the brain, right? You have new neurons, but what are those guys doing? And we have some ideas, but we haven't, we really don't know exactly. Uh, so that's, that's a, I would say that's another sort of big uh, changes uh, in neuroscience that's sort of uh, important. Mm -hmm. That's so cool because we actually have a project in my lab where we're looking at something very related to that because one animal that has a lot of neurogenesis from season to season is the bud. You know, and, and the cause of the, you know, when buds are entering mating season, the part of their brain that's responsible for sort of setting up their song builds a lot of neurons every year. And so we are, we have a project in the lab to try to understand, to try to model that part of the bird brain to understand how those new neurons are kind of integrated into the computation that they do. I would jump on that and just to take it back even further from the adult brain, I think that decades ago, there was an assumption that if something went wrong during fetal development, that that was it. You know, you, you're born, you have damage to your brain, um, cut your losses, um, institutions, this is the best it's going to get. And we really now know that things are not so simple. Um, and there was a really remarkable study. I, it was a little, maybe a decade ago now, but it's still just so remarkable that they looked at babies who had been exposed to crack cocaine during pregnancy with the expectation that the neurologic changes that were seen as infants and that had been, uh, that had occurred during the fetal period would lead to long-term problems, the way that fetal alcohol um, exposure does. And what they found was looking back that all of the differences they saw could be accounted for by poverty and not by the exposures, but really by the experience of poverty and the adverse effect of that on the developing brain. And Along with that, uh, children who had Down syndrome and other neurodevelopmental disorders that were not given intensive therapies had such poor outcomes and really had such poor quality of life. And when that was also turned on its head and they got more intensive early interventions, we're now starting to see that the limits are not there in the way that perhaps their parents were counseled, you know, when, when they were, when they were first born. And I also think, you know, within, within my field, within genetics, we used to have to try to figure out what kids had, what, what's the one gene that's not working? Where's the one spelling change and hunt and send the testing for one gene at a time. And what that required was for all of the kids to have read the book about what they're supposed to look like and what they're supposed to do if they have that condition. Now, instead of sending one test at a time, we can send rapid broad testing, um, doing exome sequencing or genome sequencing. Now we're doing even more. And we, and that doesn't require you to come in with a hypothesis about which gene is changed. You just find out what it is. And we're now learning that our conception of what constitutes a genetic disorder and what does that, what role does that one gene play and what are the different phenotypes you can see is much wider and broader than we had previously suspected, not just for malformations, but also for neurodevelopmental disorders and seizures and other, um, other disorders that affect the brain as well. And I think we're really um, having to take a step back and 
reconsider that some of these things we thought were static are really plastic and have opportunities for potential interventions. Yeah, I would also add, you know, sort of thinking about changes to the brain, you know, all throughout development, right? Even things that we do, activity that we do, like if you, for example, have depression, you can actually change molecular expression of things like factors, growth factors, hormones can really change neural, neural behavior, uh, their excitability. And certainly in the case that Adrian talked about, you know, the songbirds, it's really most of those neuronal um, population growth is under hormonal control, for example. So, so it's really interesting to think about how um, a lot of environmental factors can really affect uh, adult and you know, developing all throughout uh, and your state of being, right? Mental health can really even affect how genes are being expressed in your cells and vice versa, right? So your genetic codes, of course, you know, contributes to how, how your brain works or doesn't work, but the other way as well. So I think that's sort of, is a very sort of cutting edge idea in neuroscience that I think is really important. So very cool. Uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, these are really good questions and kind of connects together. Um, what are your thoughts on brain connectomics? I think someone should probably um, explain what that means because I had to look that up. Uh, <laughs> I could start forgetting about that. Yeah. yeah. So definitely go for it, Adrian. Sure. So um, connectomics has been a really hot topic in the field for a few years. So that I, some of you might have seen once um, a guy called Sebastian Son wrote a book about this. And he also gave a famous TED talk at which he kind of made the whole audience chant, you are your connectome. I am my connectome, which means that, that you are the sum of the ways that the neurons in your brain connect to one another. So a connectome is kind of a complete wiring diagram of all the neurons in the brain and which one connects to which, which other one. So the field has come a hugely long way in being able to actually extract connectomes because the way you do it is you take uh, slices of tissue, very, very thin, and you look at them with electron microscopy so you can get all the details of all the edges of all the cells. And so now you have this stack of, of, of images of sort of circles basically. And now you have to somehow piece them together so you can now figure out all the processes of the neurons and how, you know, what are the points at which they attach to one another, which is an enormous computational problem. But uh, Google got into this game a few years ago and uh, along with Sebastian Sung's group, they have made amazing progress in being able to computationally figure out how to stitch all those images together to really figure out um, the, the morphology and the, and the connections between neurons. And so we are rapidly gaining a lot more information about connectomics than we had in the olden days. Where that's been very influential is in studies of Drosophila. So the first connectome, full connectome that's been made is of this fruit fly, which is one of the favorite systems in neuroscience because it's very well characterized genetically. And now if you are a Drosophila neuroscientist, you, you have to understand the connectome. You, you need to, um, when you frame your studies, you have no excuse but to really look up how that part of the brain that you study is connected to other parts of the brain and what the sorts of the types of neurons there that, that are in that part of the brain um, are doing. And so it's been very influential. Drosophila is a bit different than humans, right? They are very cool and very clever, but they really are uh, a lot more stereotyped than, than mammals. And so when you look at a mammalian brain, Although it's organized, as you know, as all you neuroanatomists know, in a, in a very similar way, you know, from individual to individual, the way that the details of the connections are set up, of course, is going to be completely different for every individual. And that was Sebastian's point in saying you are your connectome because the details of how your brain wires up is kind of what, in some sense, makes you you, right? It's what makes your brain unique. So it will take an immense amount more time and effort to, to extract a connectome of even a mouse. And there's a lot of push in the field for, for us to do that, but it's going to take you know, years and lots and lots of money. So the question about, is that the right way to invest money to, to get that um, resource available? If every mouse that you do is going to be set up completely differently. So really one would need lots and lots of mice to be able to understand anything from it. And so the idea that we're going to get to the point of having human connectomes, which is what 
a lot of these Silicon Valley people would like, and that that is going to let you upload your brain. And so you will live forever in the, in the cloud, right? Because your brain can be simulated. That is just not going to happen. <laughs> That's not true. The amount of data needed to do that is enormous, but it's, it's a much deeper problem than that because just knowing the shapes of neurons and how they're connected together doesn't tell you about how they will behave, you know, what the activity patterns that, that will happen in the brain are because those depend on so many other things. You know, as we, we talked about at the beginning, they're gonna depend on what your gut is telling your brain, you know, how your brain is connected to your body, what chemicals are flowing through the brain that's altering the way that signals move between neuron to neuron. And so just the connectome itself is not going to capture the dynamics of the brain that make you you. So that's, a, you know, I think the question had a little bit about some of the ethics of, of connectomics. And so I think there are two issues. One is, is, is it the right thing to invest money in? And the, the question of, is it ethically reasonable to form a connectome of someone and upload it, I think is moot because it won't, it won't do what people um, hope it will do. Can I just add one tiny agreement to Adrian, and it's a quote from somebody who is, I am a huge admirer of her work, a world, world renowned neuroscientist, Corey Bargman, who has fully mapped, uh, along with many others, the connectome of a tiny, tiny worm. Okay. It's called C. elegans. And she said at a talk, we have the full map, but we still can't explain the behavior. And then she ended up, we have ourselves to blame. And I, th I thought it was a really interesting thing. That said, I agree that the connectome is clues, but not full explanation. Yeah, to, to you know, underscore Tom's point about C. elegans, C. elegans has 301 neurons. <laughs> and we have how many, how many billions of neurons in our brain? It's about 80 billion, and 80 they have billion. 301 plus or minus zero. So if we can't understand how 301 neurons work together from the connectome, we're not really, we're not going to understand a more complex system. Well, probably we'll resist as well, right? Just because you understand my connectome, even if you did, doesn't mean you understand me, I would say, right? Because I might change uh, I, from point moment to moment, right? And so I think the connectome is a really cool idea to think about, uh, you know, to, to have a deeper understanding of how these really complex cells and systems are working, but time and experience changes everything. So that's a, another huge dimension that one, one can think about. And obviously, you know, I am Zen because I have these sets of neurons maybe, and I have this set of experience, but then things are changing anyway, right? So uh, I think it's interesting, um, the idea of connectomes and, and whether or not we should invest, you know, as a society money into it or, if we did, what do we what what is it going to be used for? You know, is it going to be used to evaluate us and say, you know, Zen has those connections, she's good for that. This person has some other connections, maybe they'll be good for that. I don't know. Uh, that's an interesting thought. Okay. Um, I think uh, this is a really nice way to transition into a different a little bit of a different topic uh, of society and equity discussions uh, surrounding neuroscience. So the very first uh, one that, that I have here is how do the interdisciplinary aspects of neuroscience field improve accessibility? And how do you think the field can contribute to improve in this way? So anyone else? Um, Aaron, do you wanna get started on that? Sure, I can kind of get us started. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I think we can, we, can think about accessibility in different ways, right? Um, I mean, maybe the most obvious is, you know, do all do all people um, uh, who could benefit from a technology have access to it, right? So here we might think about um, about whether devices are too costly for individuals to pay for or for insurance to pay for. Um, but but I think there's there's another kind of accessibility, right? That um, our devices. Uh, uh, are there, are there people for whom devices are never built in the first place or, um, or devices are built, but they don't meet their needs, right? So this is a, a, another kind of important um, aspect of, of accessibility. And I think this kind of uh, accessibility is, is particularly suited to interdisciplinary work. So, um, so for instance, one of the things that, um, 
that I do within the, uh, the Center for Neurotechnology that Adrian and, and, and Tom have been a part of um, is, uh, is interview people um, who have um, brain devices or who might benefit from brain devices. Um, you know, people with Parkinson's disease or central tremor or um, obsessive compulsive disorder or spinal cord injury and, and ask them kind of what they, not only what they most want from uh, out of a potential device, but, but also what kinds of uh, things they, they value, what kinds of concerns they might have about, about devices. And so, um, and so in terms of interdisciplinarity, what, that, what we're able to sort of do is sort of gather that kind of information from, um, from individuals and, and feed it back to people who are um, developing devices, right? And, and maybe influence in, in, in certain ways um, uh, the development of those devices, you know, from early stages, sort of the conceptions of, of, um, of devices aimed at humans to, to translations of those, right, that might actually go into, um, into people's brains and, and uh, treat diseases or uh, provide assistance with different kinds of disabilities. I was just going to add to that, um, in you know spinal cord injury when I first started again I was very focused on neurons <laughs> being a neuroscientist I wanted to you know repair the nervous system make axons grow again and make connections uh, you know where they 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 were severed right um, but in fact uh, you know a psychologist and um, a rehab person actually did a survey and you know I thought they would want to walk again, right? I would like to reconnect those uh, ner pathways, uh, neural pathways. And in fact, that's not really what they want, uh, the patients, I mean, you know, so patients with cervical spinal cord injury, they have uh, bowel and bladder problems. Uh, they cannot, uh, uh, you know, void themselves. So that's the number one thing, right? Bowel and bladder and sexual function. No, number one was never walking because uh, you know the wheelchair gets them around enough. Uh, however, it affects the quality of life uh, for a person if they aren't able to um, you know deal with bowel, bowel and bladder movement. So I mean the interdisciplinariness of it is so important uh, for neuroscience as well as all the medical fields because then I shouldn't be just thinking about neurons, uh, I should be thinking about a whole person who has this brain, right, or the spinal cord that's injured. Uh, so in that way, I think it really helps. Um, uh, I'm not sure how that addresses uh, accessibility, though. So, uh, but that's more of an interdisciplinary thing that really helps. Um, all right. Uh, anyone else wanted to add to accessibility? Yeah, I'll add something just real quick from um... When I, when I was in neuroscience and, and um, one of my focuses was on autism. And when I started out, I think there was a sense of like, as we were sort of categorizing um, sort of brain function and, and sort of connections between autism and, and neurotypical individuals that we somehow had to figure out how to um, strengthen or change or, or sort of like help um, sort of autistic brains become somehow different. And I think what, um, you know, learning from fields like bioethics and sort of some more societal models of disability and things like that, we kind of slowly have started to have a better understanding that there's also just variability in, in the brain that there is, it's not necessarily like this is the right way or the healthy way or, or, you know, but there's also just variability that like can be really beneficial and, and actually really incredible. Um, and so sometimes it's not, that we need to change anything about the individual and sometimes we just need to change the environment and we need to sort of have sort of better support there and not kind of expect every brain to function in the exact same way in, in one type of environment and so maybe it's just sort of being more open about that um so it kind of really has sort of changed the field to sort of think more more broadly about how we talk about things how we categorize things um and and sort of how we sort of appreciate the variability as opposed to just categorizing it as like good or bad or sort of weak or strong but just Sometimes it might just be different and in a really cool way. Something I, I'd like to just add in, and which is really talking to any, anyone out there that might be thinking about moving into the field of neuroscience as a thing to study and how the breadth of it um, opens, opens it up uh, very widely as I think a very accessible field because there are just so many routes into neuroscience, right? No matter what you like, you know, if you like math, if you like philosophy, if you like psychology, 
there are ways to contribute to the field that that are there for you. You know, I never, I actually hated biology when I was a kid. I, you know, I thought it, well, okay, I loved it when I was little, but then when I was in high school, I was like, ah, it's so messy and so complicated. And the purity of physics was something that really spoke to me. And it took me some years to realize that many of those ideas were absolutely applicable, again, to, to neuroscience and to the brain. So I think, and now I think the same is true for computer science. Now, you might be a kid that loves, you know, to hack, but there, are, there is a place for you in the field because there's so much to be done by people with that kind of training. So I think it just is an incredibly broad and open and exciting area of study that, that you know, welcomes all comers, you know, no matter what your, your kind of intellectual background. I would just couple on what Sarah was uh, talking about with the concept of neurodiversity is the way that we talk about it a lot within pediatrics. And one of the um, positive aspects of this terrible COVID pandemic that we have all been experiencing um, over uh, the past year has been, I think, a, an ability for people to understand the strengths and weaknesses of different ways that children learn and that some of the kids that just were not succeeding in the way that we said you have to do school uh, do great with online learning. And when you put them in a different learning context have done really well. And conversely, some children that really thrive and learn very well within an in-classroom setting, you put them in online learning or remote learning or the more socially motivated children, you take away their social, and they really start to struggle and start to look more pathologic. You know, the kids that we thought, this is not the way that your brain should work because we've said, this is the way brains are supposed to be. We now see that, well, you, you know, you change the context and they might work just fine. Um, so it's been really interesting for us to see that maybe our con this concept of neurodiversity, um, maybe not going all the way out to some of the, you know, extreme ends of autism or other neurodevelopmental um, disorders, but certainly in flexibility of learning and being more tolerant and appreciate that different environments may be um, better or worse suited, uh, depending on what's going on in the world around us. Great, thank you so much. Um, all right, so uh, the next question we have is, what are some equity challenges you've had to overcome in your field? Anybody wanna take a stab at that? I'll take a stab, not, not me personally having to overcome, but I think on behalf of our patients. Um, one of the things in clinical medicine, you cannot get away from equity issues and health equity is, it is just a huge thing. And we are limited in the kinds of genetic testing, services, diagnostic testing, interventions, everything, we are limited by a patient's insurance in the United States. And if you have great insurance, you have strong advocates who are organized and can get you to all the therapies, you're gonna do better. Uh, and if you don't have good insurance and you don't have parents that are organized enough to get you to those places, um, you just are not going to be afforded the same privileges in what you can overcome. And we have a huge issue in trying to make sure that patients get equitable access to testing, equitable access to interventions, equitable access to um, different treatments. And to really, uh, we've now on our rounds, just in the last few months at Seattle Children's Hospital have introduced into our medical rounds at the end, going through the checklist. Are there any issues, safety issues, are the equity issues? Are there any equity issues that we need to address? And it, it was something that I think was a long time in coming in getting that as part of what we're talking about for the medical issues for patients. But ignoring it is not doing anybody any favors. There are specific things you know, we're, we're working with in my own research where we're doing rapid genome sequencing for all babies that are admitted to the NICU or offering it for families that don't have a clear source of just prematurity, that sort of thing, because follow-up and later insurance testing is such, is such a big issue. We're also trying to do that in some other populations as well. Um, but it, it's a... Um, it's something that I think the time has come to bring it on the forefront of all of our discussions. I might, I might want to add a, a slightly different perspective of equity, again, not from me personally, but for the people I work with, which are my students. And 
how important it is to welcome diverse students into our labs. And that is challenging if these diverse students need to get jobs outside of the university to make ends meet. So they can't spend the time out of the classroom or the time over the summer working on research. And so one of the greater challenges for equity is making a fair, accessible, financially, an open environment to students of all ages in our labs. And I, I know looking at the team here, I know that that is the case, but in fact, it's not uniform. And, and so I think thinking very deeply about how we can make our field and real research experiences from high school all the way to um, seniors, I'd, and I mean retired people, <laughs> accessible to join us in the research. I think that's a, I think it's a serious issue. It's not a solved issue. And I just wanted to add that we care about making the field accessible too. Yeah, just to add to that, you know, I, I just recently learned that NIH has uh, the sort of funding available for supplement, uh, you know, people who have grants uh, to hire underrepresented minorities. So money and policy play a big role in how we can actually allow accessibility to occur while we sit and think about it, you know, really, really creative ways of thinking about it. Where is the need? I think, you know, neuroscientists and all scientists need to be at the table when they're talking about policy decision and how money is being spent, for example, right? And so it's also one, one interesting note, um, you know, and on, on the NIH uh, website, it says, you know, women and men have the same success rates uh, for NIH funding, which I think is kind of funny because I, I went to look at the numbers and they define success rate because it's based on the number of people who applied. And so women are 30% of the applicant and 70% of the applicant is male. So they say the success rate is the same, but then, you know, something interesting to think about is when I wasn't in graduate school, it's 50, 50. So where did all the females fall off? Um, you know, thinking about accessibility, right? And if you look at senior, you know, our science faculty, it's not representing the same way, the population, right? The proportions, uh, not only underrepresented minority, race, gender is a huge issue still. And then, so some interesting things to think about. All right. Um, so moving on, uh, I, would, I would like uh, a little note from everyone. What is something important that in your field that you think everyone should know about? So, uh, can, can we start with Aaron? Um, sure, so um, I think one, uh, one important thing within neuroethics is just that um, there are lots, and I think this, this gets to something that Adrian talked about with respect to neuroscience, but with respect to, to neuroethics, it's also true that there are uh, many different paths to, to neuroethics. So um, people come, come into it from neuroscience, but they also come into it from philosophy, law, um, psychology, um, uh, various, uh, various different fields. Um, and they all, and, and um, people bring um, that diversity of, of background and, uh, and expertise. Uh, and I think that's just really important for, for a field that uh, is aiming to, to be interdisciplinary in its, um, at its core. Tara, do you want to add to that? Sure. Um, oh, that's a good question. I think that one area that's maybe less relevant to the overlap um, with neuroscience, but just more broadly, um, commercial genetic testing has become uh, something that's a hobby. You know, you go down at Target and there are signs, hey, it's 70% off, get your ancestry testing or get your uh, 23andMe or, um, you know, all of this. And Genetics is complicated, the interpretation is complicated, and you can find information that you are not necessarily prepared for um, and that you may not want, uh, or other people in your family may not want. So I would say it's, you know, uh, really be careful about, you know, direct to consumer genetic testing does not come with genetic counseling, pre test counseling, post test counseling interpretation. So for all of those individuals in, um, it, for either yourselves or other individuals that are thinking about doing like recreational genetic testing, um, just just think twice uh, about that. 
uh, or make sure that you are um, really prepared for all of the types of information that could come back your way. Just a quick add to that, you know, data is not always information, right? So, mm -hmm. so you get this thing and it's always, I mean, somebody in my family did it and then it was very like, yeah, okay, so now what? You know, it, it, it was just kind of like mm -hmm. curiosity, but um, but then you think about, you know, can someone else see that? And then can they be doing other things, nefarious things to our data, right? So that's something else to think about yeah. as well. There's huge privacy issues with direct-to-consumer genetic testing that are not there for, for clinical-based testing. Um, that is a definitely a huge thing. And a lot of pa patients, unfortunately, come in having done that testing and think that they ruled out all genetic disease right. because of that testing when it's just not the case. So Sarah, do you want to add to uh, the conversation about what you would like some everyone to know about your field? <laughs> Something um, important. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just looking, this is the hard one. Um, I think I think to me, like the big thing that comes to mind is just that like, I, I remember... Um, you know, through grad school and, and postdocs and things like that. And, you know, people ask what you do and they're like, I'm like, oh, I'm in, you know, neuroscience. And it was just like, the, the reaction is you're like, oh, wow, like, that's amazing. You know, you must be so smart. <laughs> and my response is always, you know, like, I know, <laughs> I won't speak for any other panelists, but at least for myself, like it is, is more about being very curious um, and honestly, really stubborn, um, thinking about the same problem for, for a long time. But um, there's just so much room for so many different um, perspectives and just like sort of thinking about a problem, being really, really curious, asking a lot of questions, um, learn to sort of like not to uh, assume things. I think you have to get really comfortable saying, I don't know a lot. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you can kind of do that and be curious, um, just, I mean, even when I used to uh, go out into like say fourth grade classrooms um, and sort of do like mini neuroscience lectures, the questions that I got were honestly really hard and I had to go back and like look up things in like my old textbooks or like new new papers and things like that like you know like people can you know experience the world and sort of have their own like um they, they kind of bring it to the table when they they ask questions and that's always really cool because everyone has a very different experience so I'd say um yeah it's just being very curious um will will get you a, a long way and it can actually kind of take you farther than you think um to sort of have you, you know, just ask really interesting questions because I think the most people that I have admired the most, honestly, just like ask the best questions. Great, thank you, Tom. Yeah, I just uh, this is a hard question, and you know, <laughs> I come back to what keeps me going every day. Okay, and the thing I think that keeps me going every day is I just love the diversity of neural systems on the planet. <laughs> If you think about it, not only are we all amazing functioning things, but you know the, the brain and communication system of diverse organisms, I, I feel like moments of David Attenborough just drop on me every day. You know, the, the octopus is communicating with skin color patterns and bees are doing vector algebra. And it just, it, what nature has done and how natural systems are doing so many different tasks, some that humans can't do. I, I just think the world is full of beauty and elegance and in the neural systems that support these diverse things, it just keeps me coming every day. That, that's what people should know is it doesn't, it, people are wonderful, brains are wonderful, but brains can be quite tiny. <laughs> Adrian, you want to add a last note to that? Yeah, I guess from where I sit, you know, in computational neuroscience, half my world is about the brain and the other half, at least from the sidelines, is about artificial intelligence and where we're going with that field. And I think um, that has a couple of messages for us. We are, one is that AI is really coming very rapidly, maybe more rapidly than, than we appreciate. Um, you know, the, the networks that are being built are getting ever more complex. They're getting more and more real in the way they can interact with us. And so it's a bit, it's tempting to think, and, it, and it's been useful to think that we can learn from those networks to interpret what the brain does. I think it's important to realize that that they are not brains, right? We have a long way to go in really understanding how brains work. Neuroscience is still wide open despite all of the 
the advances in in AI, and they are you know I, engineers sometimes get a little bit carried away with the similarities. There are some similarities superficially in some of the the visual networks that people have trained, and once you put in some things like memory or long time scales right into those into those artificial networks, they work better. And so there's su suggestive correlations, but we really still know very little about, about the, the deep principles that are in the, the biology of the brain. And so I, I wouldn't want the fact that we can build intelligent systems to make, to give us the false impression that we've sort of understood everything in neuroscience. We really still have a lot of fun <laughs> and, and interesting work to do. And particularly not just fun and interesting, but also really important to being able to control and um, and deal with with mental disorders and, and other kinds of brain brain problems that are vital for human health. Thank you. I would just add to that, since I study spinal cord injury, you know, I think a lot of neuroscientists end at the brain and then after the brainstem, they just don't have any idea what the heck is going on down there. And so I would, I would make a, make, make a suggestion that the, you know, the spinal cord is, it is part of the, the central nervous system and that that's an important part that people might not think about and that it you can actually have a lot of learning that occurs in the spinal cord as well. So I think that's sort of a, a surprising uh, maybe part of, you know, you, you just think of the spinal cord as like a highway, uh, which someone described to me, you know, th that connects information and the peripheral systems to the brain. But in fact, there's a lot of learning that occurs in the spinal cord as well. And the same sort of plasticity that we just talked about um, uh, it, that occurs in the brain also occurs in the spinal cord, but not exactly in the same way either. So, you know, even though it's the same compartment uh, as we define anatomically, I think um, set spinal cord presents us with a, a different challenge and interesting challenge. So, all right, to kind of wrap up um, this portion, we have a really interesting question that uh, Tom already alluded to a little bit already. So how has studying neuroscience changed your outlook on the world and how you interact with the world. Who wants to go first? I'll go first because it'll be really fast. So you know, I think it really comes down to things that other people have said, which about neurodiversity. You know, for me, learning about underlying brain mechanisms for for many things, right? For various types of behaviors, for your propensity to be able to be addicted to things has really made me over the course of my, you know, now quite long life, um, be much more, I guess, compassionate about, about, you know, people's distinct situations that, that really, you know, we are a little bit somewhat hardwired, you know, in ways that are, that are more diverse. So, so ways that people behave are not always a moral choice. They are a result of, of, brain wiring, environment, all kinds of influences that have, that have occurred to them throughout their life. And I think that we can learn a lot from neuroscience about, about making appropriate judgments and, and having compassion. Great, Sarah, do you wanna to add to that? Sure, yeah, I think, um, yeah, just this sort of appreciation for how how complex the brain is and just like sort of how in awe I feel of it. It just, I think it's so easy and, and I still do it. Like, you know, you get caught up in the day-to-day -day mundane stuff, whether it's, you know, grant details or all that stuff you have to do for work or, or sort of, you know, errands and all these other things. And then, you know, kind of when you get into, you know, a data set or, or something else like that, and you just kind of see just like how incredibly like beautiful and complex the brain could be and also how much we have worked at it and how much we still have yet to understand it. It's just like really incredible um, and really awe inspiring. And I think it helps me kind of be out of myself and out of the sort of boring day to day and just getting caught up in that and just like, yeah, truly being on like how, how incredibly cool it is to be human and how, how much we still have yet to understand. Um, yeah. Great. Tara. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, framing it in that way. Um, I was in the very first class of neurobiology majors at UW. I switched, I changed my major into the, um, the first class from um, molecular and cell biology. And, you know, that was before the Human Genome Project was completed. You know, PCR was like the cutting edge of all cutting edge technology um, at that time. 
we didn't understand the, the number of things that we just didn't understand. Like my entire field is basically stuff that didn't exist when I was an undergrad. And I think that that it's, it's really awe-inspiring and is so fun um, to be at really the cutting edge of understanding, but also keeps you very humble to think mm-hmm. that, gosh, I just 10 years from now, you know, if you, if you're an undergrad and you're not sure what your career is going to look like. And people ask you, what do, what do you want your career to look like in 10 years? Well, your field may have literally not been invented yet. Um, so, and you can really be on the, on the cutting edge of that. So I think that it's just so fun and so cool. And I thought I was going to go out and really contribute to understanding the brain. And I have contributed to really not understanding the brain um, at this point. And and every day I just think like, gosh, it's just so complicated. And with more and more discoveries, it just gets more and more complicated. And I've just resigned myself to um, going along for the ride while we, uh, while we try to figure out little pieces of it. Aaron, do you want to add to that? Sure. I, I mean, I guess uh, as sort of a corollary to, to that idea that um, the sort of the, the, the um, the beauty uh, of, the, of the complexity, um, I guess one of the things that has struck me about that is that we, as we discover just how complicated <laughs> things are, that, that, um, that people like, like those on the panel um, become specialized in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in really deep ways. And so I think one of the things that I've been constantly impressed by is it's just the way the way in which we then have to rely on um, those within our community to become experts in these uh, in these uh, very specialized ways and sort of the trust that that uh, that that involves um, uh, in that we all um, are sort of in a communal effort because we can't we can't do it you know unlike uh, unlike scientists in the in the 16th century we can't we can't learn everything right we we have to um, re- rely on um, uh, on our colleagues to um, to become experts and, and sort of um, learn learn from there uh, and appreciate their excitement within within their domains. Wow, that's that's great. Well, we can end on that note, and then also that you know this panel is an example of how all these different uh, ways that one can approach neuroscience, and so hopefully um, we'll have exciting questions from the. St- from the audience for the next round. So we'll see you, see everybody back here in about 10 minutes, I believe. So thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists for such an educational and inspiring discussion. This intermission is the perfect time to come up with questions for the Q&A portion of the event. You can enter into our raffle by filling out our seed feedback survey at tiny.cc slash EWN feedback at the end of the event. However, the more questions you ask in the Q&A, the more chances you have to be entered to win some awesome prizes, including a candy basket from Sweet Mickey's, Grey Matter stickers, a Rainworks kit, and some awesome art supplies. Kick back, relax, and we'll see you all in 10 minutes for the Q&A portion of our event.
Welcome back, everyone. Hope you enjoyed your intermission. We're now ready to get into the most fantastic part of the evening, the live Q&A. This is your opportunity to get your questions answered by the experts. Ask away. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so we're going to start this portion with questions from the audience. Uh, so this is very exciting. Um, Terry, uh, to Dr. Klein, do you see more studies to be done on the application of electronic music in cognitive neuroscience for rehab purposes, rehabilitation purposes? Do you anticipate your work in neuroethics to be overshadowed by unchecked enthusiasm for neuroengineering? Interesting. Um, well, so um, I'm not I'm not sure that I um, can answer the first one, uh, and maybe someone else on the panel is, is better positioned to to answer that. Um, uh, but but you know I think the second question is a really a really good one and a and a really tough one. Um, you know I think um, I guess I would say that I don't I don't see uh, my role in in neuroethics as um, as being um, Concerned about being overshadowed because I don't I don't think that um, people who who do um, who do neuroethics should be uh, should be out there front uh, front and center but uh, but being but rather being sort of a part of the conversation and in um, walking uh, alongside uh, neuroscientists you know I, I think that um, one thing that might speak to this is is the um, you know President Obama when he uh, um, uh, uh, launched the brain initiative included as part of it that uh, that ethical reflection on the implications of neuroscience um, and the brain initiative uh, needed to be a part and so I think there was a rec there's been a recognition um, for some time now and this has been sort of uh, um, supported by funding that uh, that that neuroethics needs to, needs to be um, uh, needs to be a part of development uh, of neuroscience and particularly neuroengineering. So, um, so I think, uh, so I think, I guess, I guess what I would say, say is that I think there is always a risk when, when there's anything that's, that's exciting and captures the, the uh, public imagination that that might overshadow um, uh, downsides to, to anything, to any, any technology, any, um, any, uh, uh, any intervention. Um, but I think that, um, I guess I'm not, I'm not worried um, that it's gonna be overshadowed. I think the, the question might also hit on, on issues that, um, that I'm, I hope people you know, do have concerns about, which is that uh, more and more, you know, state-of-the-art neural engineering is going into the hands of private companies and they are perhaps less well-regulated reg well than, than we might want them to be. And so I think, you know, though Iran didn't say it, you know, that this is why the sorts of work that, that he and others are doing is so important because we do need to get out ahead of this and to communicate with governments who have the responsibility to potentially rein in some of the work that the companies are doing because we, I don't think we can trust Elon Musk to do it for himself. So it's, you know, I, I think it's, it's great to raise that issue of, of the need, right, for social awareness of, of neuroethical issues around, around BCI. And, you know, that's why, why we need um, work like, like Iran's. So I might also add that, you know, in neural engineering and, and all the other different fields in neuroscience, you know, the advances are being made every day and we don't really know what's going to have an impact. We can imagine it. And when we write grants, we always think we, we, we know where the trajectory is, but we actually don't. Right. And so some of the discoveries we've made in the past, you know, just came from accidental things. Right. And so I think um, having neuroethicists along the way as we discover new things is just the right thing to do that. I'm really excited that that's happening more. Um, and, and so I think that that is an important point. So, yeah. 
so we have another question from Ben. Uh, is there much understanding regarding how much someone's personality is determined by neurons and how much is determined by life experiences and development? Interesting. Um, I don't, I'm, I don't have an answer, but I have a study design that I'm dying for someone to do. So maybe I'll just share that. So every, you know, I remember during, you know, undergraduate psychology and neurobiology courses, hearing about individuals that were identical twins that were separated at birth in closed adoptions and were raised independently of one another and in adulthood had striking similarities and preferences and music preferences and mannerisms and all kinds of things like that. Um, but now we have all sorts of um, different permutations of that because we have um, egg donation, different gamete donation, egg donations, um, sperm donation, but also embryo donation, embryo donation adoption, where you have individuals from the same batch of embryos that are, you know, uh, implanted in someone who is not related genetically and then raised in that family, but you also have surrogacy. So you have people who have the um, have their own genetic embryo implanted into someone else to give birth and then returned back to the, um, to the original family who's genetically related to raise. And I think this makes just a fascinating um, uh, diagram, you know, you could, you could map it all out in terms of what are the effects of the pregnancy itself? What are the effects of the genetic um, family of origin? What are the effects of the um, social family and, and all those different factors? So I don't know that I have a, a great answer for that. Um, I do think though that as a mother of four children that temperament is just kind of born in kids and they're definitely, and as a pediatrician, they're from the get-go kids are just kind of born the way that they're born. And the kids that there are, you can't parent a temperament out of a child, even though you can um, maybe have better or worse mismatch. And I do think that there is some, there is some effective environment, obviously, but there's also just an inborn temperament that children have that, that contribute largely to their personalities. I would, I would agree with that. I have two very different children. <laughs> <laughs> Neither of them are like myself or my husband either. So maybe they're adopted. I don't know. Uh, switched at birth. But it, it's really interesting. I think there's actually a movie, right, where there, there were twins that were taken away. Um, I can't remember, but maybe someone remembers. And then they they, they met as adults. Uh, I think there was like an adopt trap. It sounds oh, like the parent not trap. that one. It was a documentary uh, where I think the children were taken away, you know, uh, and then separated. Um, I can't. Yeah, remember. it was a twins that it was an um, adoption agency in New York that would yeah. systematically actually split twins up, send them to different different families, and then they were studied in the different families as part okay. of the twin study over many years. Yeah. And then only later in their adult life did they find out that they were twins, and there was quite a lot of pain actually I remember they focused particularly on a triplet you know yeah. group that got reunited right as when they were older yeah it's a fascinating story also uh you know another interesting thing is you know one of my um aunts adopted uh, a child and uh this is you know the same racial makeup but you know she would somebody didn't know and said, oh, she, she dunked the tea exactly the same way you do, you know? And so sometimes you, what we think of as personality traits are maybe learned and not genetic. And we don't really know. We're still learning what traits are, you know, being influenced, even hair color. We don't know exactly where it is, right? We know some genetic influences. So I think it's an interesting, um, interesting topic to think about. Uh, all right. So next question, uh, should voluntary neuro interventions be allowed in the future as an alternative to incarceration considering the current state of US prison system? That's a, that's a nice, interesting one. I guess- I guess I can, I can start. Um, I guess I, I'm skeptical, skeptical that, that a technology um, is going to solve our, our social and political problems, um, such as those that inhere in our current uh, incarceration system. Um, you know, technology is a tool and it can be used, um, it can use, 
to uh, you can be used to support unjust systems um, just as easily, maybe more easily than it can be to, to do the opposite. So, um, and I guess um, my biggest my biggest concern here, I guess in the in the in the question is you know turns on the the term voluntary, right? So, um, you know, jails and prisons are inherently coercive environments, and um, and so talking about a, a voluntary um, choice is sort of problematic there. I mean, you know, imagine a imagine a uh, an implantable brain device that um, that purports to reduce um, aggression or violence, right? I mean, at first we we might wonder whether um, the understanding of of aggression and violence that the criminal justice system uses operates under um, already sort of problematically intertwined ways with with race and class, um, but but at but second, I mean, imagine if, you know, that this person comes before a judge and promises to get a brain implant for a lesser sentence or, a, or, or parole. I mean, do we, do we really think that that's a free or, or voluntary choice? Uh, I mean, be very skeptical. And voluntary also has differential economic backgrounds. So in any case, this is a, it's a, it's a, a difficult path. I think the next question kind of connects um, the last uh, question and the thoughts we have on it. Does our legal system have the capacity to implement neuroscience research in the future? For example, should data from EEG and other neurotechnology be permissible in court, for example? And would, uh, yeah. I can take a short stab at this and I'll tell you why. I have no legal knowledge or experience whatsoever but I teach a non-majors neuroscience class and we have a every year a guest lecture from Lee Vaughn from the law school here, Dr. Lee Vaughn, and her area is law and neuroscience. And it's on something called the um, admissibility of evidence. Is fMRI admissible? So if a person says, you know, please image my brain and I will demonstrate to you, I was actually, I am, I am incapable of carrying out that function or even thinking that thought. And so this is an emerging area called neuro law. And um, she will be lecturing in my class on May 18th. <laughs> so, uh, but in fact, there's a large literature on uh, in the state of Washington, they're called Fry hearings. That is a type of legal admissibility of evidence and um, fMRI, EEG, not so much. Uh, but um, uh, that's sort of where the state of the art is. It's a really great question. Um, and I think it's we're, we're at the edges of that right now. And, you know, sort of turning to everybody else on the panel, they know that this has powerful ethical issues associated with it. Yeah, another component of that is the rapidly evolving ability to decode information from, from brain activity. And that, you know, that is one of the drivers of, of brain computer interfaces is that we are actually getting better, right, at being able to read off activity from electrodes and be able to translate that into visual um, images. And so the, you know, one of the ethical issues coming down the pike is, is the privacy of that data. If that data can be monitored, is it, is it reasonable to allow that data to be made available, say to an employer or to, you know, there may be all kinds of things hidden in the patterns of, of activation that can reveal things about you that, that you might not want to, you know, to have revealed. And so let's say you agree to have a brain scan or activity taken under some condition, that data set now goes out into the world. Five years later, people are able to mine it for things that, that you had no um, expectation would be able to be mined for. You know, what do we do about that, right? So I, you know, along, I think big part of, of neuroethics right now is trying to figure out you know, issues around, around data privacy for, for brain, brain data. And just one little, little twist to this. I agree, Adrian, completely. Um, you can put an electrode, very, very low technology electronics on your skull. And you can show an individual pictures of faces. And if they don't recognize them, you don't really see much. But as soon as it's a face that you recognize, you get a unique signal. It's called the P300. It's sort of a, ha, I saw it. And you can actually get 
it's uh, you can actually determine if somebody has a recognition of the face. Now, is that admissible evidence? Um, I think that's an open question. I think that just underscores, you know, how neuroscientists and neuroethicists should be at the table, right? Again, uh, at, when we're making uh, laws and when we're making, you know, decisions about how to really proceed with all this new technology we have. So very good question. Um, yeah. From uh, Leela, what do you use? What do you use to motivate yourself when your research hits a rough patch? Well, I don't know anything about that. No one, no one on this panel probably ever had not. Definitely, very, very important question. Um, um, Tara, do you want to get started on that? Sure. Um, you know, I I really have the privilege of being in at the intersection of clinical care and research, and I find it extremely motivating and inspiring uh, to work with the patients that I work with. And there are always questions to be answered every single day uh, when you, well, maybe not every day, but almost every day, there's new things to discover. And if I think that, I, if I'm not sure where to go next, interacting with my patients is fun for a few reasons. One of them is, you know, other, your colleagues don't ask you what your third favorite reptile is, you know, and that's something that just happens in pediatrics and why it's like the best job. Um, you get all kinds of cool artwork for your office and, um, and that's, you know, that's fun. You get Christmas cards and, you know, all of those things. But the bigger thing is they, they want help and you want to help them, you know, and it's, and it's easy to try to say like, well, is something possible this year that wasn't possible last year or the year before, or this hasn't been done before, but let me reach out to my colleagues in other places and try to help. And, and I find that for myself that those, the selfish motivations are harder for me to get going than motivations to try to help other people. So if I'm motivated to try to find an answer because I think that it might help a patient that needs help, I have a much deeper well of motivation than if it's something of like, oh, I need a good idea for this. Like I need to write a paper. What should I write a paper about? I'm, I find it much more motivating to think of like, oh, that, you know, that kid whose third favorite reptile is, is an iguana um, and wants to know how you can blend human DNA with iguana DNA to make a superhero um, has a really interesting pathogenic variant that could potentially be you know, targeted with this medication, who can I talk to about kind of putting those things together? So for me, I think that being able to have that dual role um, is, is really helpful for, uh, for, for getting through those times when it's not so sure what, where the next path, uh, where the, the right next path is to go. For me, I use my superpower, which is a very short attention span. <laughs> so I, I have many projects going on at the same time. And if something is getting too gnarly, it really sometimes helps me to just switch to one of the other things and go more deeply onto that. And you know, then you find that while you're not looking at it, sometimes it, it gets easier. You know, when you come back and look at it with fresh eyes, then there you see roots or or something has happened in the meantime among the students and postdocs so you hear a talk that gives you a, a fresh insight and suddenly it looks it looks different so for me that's that helps me a lot yeah i'll add in two things one is um i try to remind myself that like we're literally working on the edge of what we know and what we don't know and not only do we not know the answer but we don't know how we're going to get to the answer and there's no like you can't go to the back of the textbook and see if you got the right answer. You have to like convince yourself you got the right answer too. Um, and so just kind of remind yourself like that's where I'm at. And I kind of look back and see how much that line has moved um, because you're always kind of thinking about the things you don't know and you don't realize like how much you kind of have learned along the way. Um, and then the other part is, is yeah, kind of going out and doing, like I mentioned before, um, you know, like outreach to, you know, fourth grade classrooms to teach, you know, neuroscience lessons and things like that. Like they are so unencumbered by our like, you know, applying for grants and all the things that kind of get us down. And they're just excited for the same things that I got excited about neuroscience and, and that I kind of came to research for. Um, and so remembering like, oh yeah, this is so cool. Like, this is so interesting. Like, and remembering those things and sort of like 
having that be my reason versus like, okay, I do have to go back and like redraft this like grant letter or do all these other things, but kind of remember like why, like that feeling that I had when I was in undergrad and like was in a classroom for the first time and like got shown a video of the McGurk effect and was like, my mind was blown. And I got so excited and like totally changed my major to be neuroscience because I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Um, so like getting back to, to those roots, I think really helps me a lot. I, I would I would uh, second that for sure. You know, just just hanging out with uh, students and teaching students, uh, they really do bring a fresh perspective. And neuroscience is hard. You know, uh, you get stuck a lot actually. <laughs> and you know, and then there are lots of different pressures to you know write a certain way, put your questions in a certain way, so that you get funding. So, but that's sort of the noisy stuff right but then you have to really think about how you really want to what is the fundamental question that you're interested in and how do you move the field forward and what can you do with your tool sets because we don't have infinite tool sets right and so i think i think we do get stuck a lot so what a great question um aaron do you want to add something to that or no i think i would just reiterate that i um uh that i when i i when I get stuck, I go and I talk to students, <laughs> and, and collaborate and collaborate with students. And uh, and there's something about the the way in which they they come to come to problems without the the, the frameworks and baggage um, uh, that that I come to that um, that I find can help me reset. Great. Um, so the next question we have is how do neuroscience uh, inform uh, quantitative user experience? How do you expect neuroscience to impact user experience in the future? And what is uh, your balance between computer science, neuroscience and user experience, et cetera, on your daily uh, basis, uh, on a daily basis in your current work? I think that's for you, Sarah. I think so. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, neuroscience has totally impacted the way the way that I think about a problem, the way that I approach a problem, just um, how I sort of start to break down, you know, what is the problem as it's presented to me and then try to kind of peel it back and try to figure out like what's kind of underlying it. Um, it's, you know, it impacts how I, how I design my studies. It impacts how I think about data analysis. Um, it's also, you know, we were talking earlier about variability and diversity. Um, and so I like try a lot to think about how can I capture a lot of the variability of, you know, like the Main product that I work on has a billion users, <laughs> and you know there's only so much we can capture in even this kind of studies that I run. But just trying to figure out ways that we can kind of have a better understanding of just all the different kinds of people that are using our product, um, and to be able to sort of capture that both the sort of variability, but also balance that with you know what are the patterns that we're seeing? How can I kind of break down that complexity as well? Um, and help the team kind of make better decisions. Um, at the end of the day, we have to figure out, you know, we have one version of the product, we can't have, um, you know, thousands or millions of them. Um, so trying to balance those things, and that's definitely something that it, um, I kind of have for my neuroscience research, where you're trying to kind of both uh, get a sense of the variability of the data, just the full richness of the data, but also sort of try to capture patterns and sort of themes that you're seeing in the data as well. Um, going to the um, sort of other question, yeah, um, in the, in the future, yeah, it'll be interesting to see, you know, just how much more is happening with our phones. Um, some of it's probably good stuff, probably some of it's not great stuff. We'll just kind of see what happens with, with technology and the ways that we, we interact with it. Um, but just sort of how we kind of understand um, how that's working in people's lives and, you know, sort of like what's kind of good use of technology, maybe um, you know, other places that, you know, maybe it's not the best play opportunity for us to help people. Um, and then, yeah, with Camino, I definitely do a lot of my own coding um, and trying to figure out how we can, um, like I said, capture data patterns, how I kind of think about data analysis. Um, I work a lot with like engineers and data scientists as well. Um, so we can try to figure out, you know, what data we should, um, what data should we should get, what data we should actually not get, what's actually going to really help us um, and sort of where we should um, sort of stay away from. I think following up on that, uh, what are your some of your day-to-day -day frustrations working in the entrepreneurial side of neuroscience research and what is your favorite part? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because, uh, you know, when I uh, was a postdoc, my, my projects would often take, um, you know, years mostly um, and now a lot of my projects are, are weeks to months. Um, so there's uh, both sort of attention and an excitement with how much things turn over that you kind of have to get 
sometimes an answer that's good enough and, and that can be kind of hard. You're trying to figure out how to best be uh, really rigorous, but also just so at the end of the day, the team needs a decision um, and needs to kind of do something fast and that's maybe better than perfect. Um, so that can kind of be hard. Um, also, you're the it's both a pro and a con that you're I'm also most of the time working with a lot of product managers, a lot of designers and writers. Um, and so it's I'm talking about research to non-researchers. Um, and there's mostly a lot of really a great appreciation for research. They're really excited to work with me. Um, but sometimes it's also trying to figure out how to um, best make sure the uh, interpretation of the data kind of stays with it, that they don't kind of pick it, cherry pick uh, their most favorite data points that kind of uh, go with their own theories, but also try to make sure that um, there's a good understanding of, of what kind of things we can be confident in, maybe some things that we should kind of leave is a little bit more tentative, um, how we should sort of understand, you know, even if you have something that's uh, two conditions that are statistically significant, that may not mean uh, sort of what they think it means. And so trying to also kind of carry with it, not just the data, but sort of how we can kind of best use the data. Um, I think one of the other panelists was talking about, you know, just having more data is not always um, the best thing and sort of sort of like trying to make sure that there's sort of good data practices as well. But it's really exciting. It's really cool to see, you know, when you do make a recommendation um, of how they should change the strategy to the team and then we we launch something and billions of people see it. Like I think just kind of see that impact and sort of how how you uh, that's helping users um, is really, really exciting um, to kind of actually see that go live and, and see that actually um, change how people are interacting with their phones. Thank you, Sarah. That's a really cool point too. That you know, we talked a lot about interdisciplinary uh, studies, and one of the things that I experienced talking to a bunch of engineers, uh, physicists, uh, mathematicians, right? And then I come from a very neuroscience-centric uh, uh, background. So sometimes the language we use, the words we use, uh, you know, there's a barrier to overcome. Uh, so sometimes uh, collaborations work really well, but sometimes it doesn't, right? So and because we're trying to bridge uh, disciplines, and I think that it takes work and practice. So um, such a good thought. Okay, the next one we have is, um, I have previously read that the males are diagnosed with autism more frequently than females. Is there a biological component to this or is there a difference, a different nuance that impact diagnosis? Yeah, that's a great question. So overall, about three and a half boys are diagnosed with autism for every girl that's diagnosed. And that's true with other neurodevelopmental disorders and intellectual disability. Some of that has to do with a lot of the genes that are involved in um, cognitive development are, are on the X chromosome. And so if you're a girl, you have two copies of the X chromosome and typically one is inactivated at random, but our, our bodies are pretty smart. And when you have a problem on one X chromosome, a lot of uh, women who carry a, a problem on one of their X chromosomes will, will disproportionately um, inactivate the one that has the problem. Men and boys only have one X chromosome and then they have the Y chromosome. And so they can't do that. And so this is, this is part of it. This is a small part of it. I think that that relates more to the, um, more neurocognitive issues, things like fragile X syndrome, et cetera, are certainly counterpart by that. But what's really interesting and that I find fascinating is if you break down that three and a half to one, but you break it down by with an overlay of intellectual disability. When you get down to the levels of autism diagnosed in the setting of intellectual disability, it's one to one, boys to girls. And when you get up to the level of normal IQ and a diagnosis of autism, it's 10 to one, boys to girls. So there's something about having normal IQ, but still having autism spectrum disorder that is just disproportionately diagnosed in boys. And I wonder sometimes for some of those, not everybody, but I wonder for some of those people, if there could be an overlay of our idea of what's acceptable neurodiversity and what's not. Because a lot of the, the way that we diagnose it, it's not an MRI, it's not an EEG, it's a series of interviews and structured play situations um, where we expect them to respond in a particular way, which has a certain degree of social motivation. And if you have a child who has less social motivation, that's more motivated by other things like trains or cars or anything else, 
as a child, that's maladaptive because they're not behaving the way that they're supposed to. But that doesn't necessarily mean that as an adult, you know, if you're really detail oriented, you're not overly social and you um, are um, very systematic, there are a lot of professions where you can really thrive in that. Um, and there was, there was one study actually that looked at, at um, rates of autism or broader autism phenotype in different professions among those with normal intelligence. So we're just looking across the board and you've got a lot of engineers and computer programmers, that's the highest number. And that they actually have the highest number of children with autism if you look across professions. And the lowest is in social workers. <laughs> um, and I think that there's, there's something to be said for what, what is neurodiversity within that. So it's an, it's an interesting question. I think that there is some biological basis, but it's not just the straightforward. I think when you hear that number, three and a half boys for every girl, it's much less interesting than when you get into the weeds and, and start teasing that out a little bit. Wow, thank you. I didn't know that. What a great question from the audience. Um, all right, uh, next we have, um, what systemic in inequities have you recognized in the neuroscience field and what actions are being taken to correct them? And where do we still need improvement? I'm not sure that in my experience of, of life that, that the inequities I see are specific to neuroscience rather than to you know, the academy and access to education, access to research opportunities. I think Tom brought up a great, a great point earlier about, um, you know, what, what gets someone to go to grad school? You know, if what you need to do to get into grad school is have research, you know, research experience of some kind. You know, our kids, we're professors, right? They, it's easy for them to find a lab and um, to figure out how to do that. If you're coming from a family that has no experience of that and, and you need to spend your summers, you know, earning, earning money to pay your rent, then you're not going to take advantage of those, of those situations in the same way. And so one, I, I absolutely underscore, you know, one of the solutions that, that Tom discussed, which is the, you know, trying to assemble funding so that people can do research as a job, right? That they, they are not having to, you know, we, this sort of unpaid internship thing, right? That, that, you know, families, you know, my kid could do that, you know, but luckily, I mean, I couldn't actually as, as a, as a student myself, but, but, but our kids can. And so that, that shouldn't put him, you know, ahead of the line for getting into graduate school over someone that just wasn't able to do that. So the more we can build opportunities at earlier stages and um, not just opportunities, but also awareness of the opportunities, right, among, among a more diverse group of students, then the more we're going, to, we're going to break down these barriers and have those kids, you know, end up in grad school and end up in professorships. Can I just, I totally agree, Adrian. I, I just want to expand on that is the, you know, I, I have everybody in my lab is paid and I, that means it limits the number, right? I can't have 30. My bandwidth limits that as well. The other thing is many of them that came into my lab didn't know that it is theoretically possible to be paid for research. And one of the things that we are not super great at is getting word out that you should ask if you're a, an undergraduate or a post back or a high school student, it's okay to ask, you know, I'd like to do research, is it possible to get paid? And, you know, for many of us, Adrian and I run several different grants for which we target funds specifically to bring in women and underrepresented uh, minorities into labs and others who will all get paid. <laughs> it's, so it's not okay to, if you're rich, you don't get paid, right? Rather, you need to make sure everybody is treated equitably and fairly and that they don't have to always go bag groceries at the grocery store. There are other ways. That, I just wanted to point that out. I just want to add, I absolutely 100% agree with all of that. And I also, just to add a couple more things, I, I think that it's really come to light in the last uh, especially in the last couple of years, I mean, the last decades, but that racism in this country is a, is a really powerful force. 
and representation matters. And I think that it's really hard to recruit students and say that this is a place where you are welcome and valued and can succeed when you don't look like any of the people who have succeeded um, and are in places of, of um, a place of, uh, um, of leadership. Um, within at Seattle Children's within the residency program, we've done a lot of work with um, teaching how to address racial microaggressions and how to empower trainees, but also faculty members to identify and point those out. And once you start learning about it and just realizing how prevalent it is, um, it's, it's been really powerful to see how, um, just how, uh, how important those things are. So I think there's the economic diversity side of things and definitely removing those barriers related to um, financial issues that student have is, is one thing, but then also improving diversity women, underrepresented minorities, um, uh, people from the LGBTQ communities, individuals who either have physical or other disabilities. I think that it's really important we start to get them represented in positions of, of um, having seats at the table as well. Yeah, that's definitely something that I, and, and Zin raised this earlier too, is just the gender issue, you know, which in the last year or two has started to feel a lot less urgent than many of the other, other issues, but it's been something that has been very much part of, part of my life, you know, through, through my training. I was, um, you know, the only woman in my physics undergraduate class. There were none in the year before or above, you know, above me, and then went on to grad school. There was one other woman that started in my physics class who dropped out in the first year. So no other women in my graduate school physics class either. And so you had constantly this feeling of sort of hanging on right by your fingers edge, you know, like, should you really be here? Is that, you know, can you really do this if no one else is doing it, right? I think I was very lucky in many ways of moving to Israel at that time because there are, um, I'm sure you, you know yourself, a lot of very just powerful, talented, brilliant Israeli women that, that I could see around me and the, the gender barriers there just seemed so much more manageable. They have great uh, family structures to help bring, you know, raise the kids while women are, are you know, in the lab or whatever. So, so it just it gave me a, a, a view of a life where, where that seemed a lot more, a lot more reasonable. But coming to the US, you know, felt like going back, you know, 20 years. And you know, I was always very aware of how many women there were at senior levels, which just wasn't many at all. And so I, you know, I, I, I agree with Tara completely that shifting the perspective on leadership, right, of, of seeing more women, I think UW is actually a great example where we have a lot of amazing women in, in, in leadership positions that, that really changes the, the nature of, of the atmosphere. And you know, we're only at the very beginning of, of doing that more generally for, for other, other mm -hmm. diverse groups. And even if it is as much progress as we've made, it's remarkable how not that long ago things were so terrible. My, uh, my PhD advisor described how she had to go, when she was doing her, um, her PhD, she had to go to the building next door to use the secretary's bathroom because there were no, and she was a neuro, she did neuroanatomy at that time, and there were no women's bathrooms um, in her building. And she funded her way through graduate school with a grant from the Miss America Foundation, which was the only scholarship that she could think of to go after that she would be eligible for, and then did early work in neurotoxicology with her grant from Miss America. Um, so it's really just in the very recent past that things have been really terrible. So it's great to see that progress, but yet so much progress. Made. One of our own students from UW, a brilliant uh, young woman, she and her, her husband uh, moved from graduate school to postdoc. She went to Harvard. And apparently her lab, every lunch, the boys would have boys club and the boys would go to lunch. The professor would join them. She was never invited. And this is like 10 years ago. It's not, it's not the far distant past. And another, another aspect that a lot of people were noticing in my, my own community is how often you would go to a conference and it would be nine men and one woman speaker. And so actually we, a group of us uh, women sort of got together and started something called Bias Watch Neuro. So we have a, a web page where we don't have to publicly shame, except we do, right? We just post the, the numbers for conferences and how many men and how many women are there 
who are speaking at a given conference, and then we post what the 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 average number of, of women and men in that in that subfield is. And so it's really shifted. It's shifted the way things are done in the community because there is this you know single place where you can see those numbers. Yeah, I, I, I think this is amazing uh, sort of conversation about, you know, representation and that it matters because, you know, I work in neurosurgery department and we are working really hard, but they're not there yet, right? The representation of even women, let alone different um, racial diversity. I mean, they have to work really hard. Um, and, and an example is, you know, we're in a faculty meeting and people are talking about, uh, say, skiing right and it seems uh mundane enough i mean we're in seattle people ski but uh if you really think about that conversation right um and then they talk about you know oh i have this vacation home and i go skiing with my family and i've done it since i was five you you can start to think about um that really seemingly benign conversation excluded a whole bunch of people uh who may not be skiers may not have the money to be skiing or, you know, people with a certain ethnic background might not ski at all, right? And so I, I think in a professional setting or, you know, people will be talking about whatever they're talking about and then a female enters into, a professor, a female enters into the elevator and then they say, oh, hey Zen, how's your family? You know, whereas their conversation previously was about science or whatever it is that they were talking about. And so, you know, representation matters because when they see Zen, do they see a female or do they see a neuroscientist or do they see a skier? Hopefully not a skier because I don't ski. <laughs> but uh, really representation matters a lot. So what a great set of questions. Um, so, okay, moving along. Uh, next question, at what point um, in the development of AI consciousness are there ethical concerns for the AI themselves? Hmm. I'll, I'll take that one partly because we talk about this every day in my house because my husband is actually um, head of a our group at Google that is you know building AI and so <laughs> we have kind of front seat access to the latest models and uh, and it's a it's an issue of uh, of enormous concern to us and to also to my kids actually they're maybe more invested in it even than than I am. So obviously that does not mean I have any better answers than anyone else out there. But one of the things that I, I think about, you know, what, you know, these models are getting more and more realistic in, you can have a conversation with them. They, they see, you know, I'm sure you've all seen at some point recently stories that have been written by AIs, little essays. Um, and, and that, that is, has reached a point where you can have a pretty fluent back and forth, you know, with with a language model, <laughs> and it's a little it's a little scary. So then, at what point does one take that that network right to be a sentient being that has has a moral um, stature right in the world? I guess one of the things that that I think about, and I'm not sure everyone else in the house even would agree with me, is is what to me gives gives that entity that stature is its existence over time and its ability to interact and make decisions and to learn from those decisions and that means it has uh, you know once it has agency and it has responsibility and it has memory then it starts to attain the you know the 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 weight i guess that we might give to to an agent you know a, a human acting in the world and that is not where they're at at the moment you know but it's not you may not be very far away so I do think it's a it's a very important concern that we we will have to address you know it's sort of in the same category as the sorts of things that Iran was talking about before you know how do we interact with brain data how are we going to interact with these very sophisticated um, artificial instantiations of intelligences and at what point do we give them to give them, you know, moral standing. And I hope that our philosopher friends will be able to really help us to, to think through those questions. Iran, would you like to pick that one up? I don't know, it's, it's such a um, such a difficult question. I, um, yeah, I, I think that, uh, I guess I, I'm, um, I'm most interested in, in the ways in which we, um, 
we come to to rely on and and trust um, and and trust these devices and and systems, um, and and the ways in which that might um, that might undermine our, our trust in ourselves um, and our own and our own capabilities and, and how that might change change us and so, um, um, you know, I, I, you know, so I, I don't I don't have uh, I don't have a great uh, a great answer to this other than to, other than to say I think it's an, an incredibly important um, uh, issue and I think that uh, it seems to be. Uh, it seems to be rapidly developing, and and I worry that we're, that uh, even though there there is, there's an increasing amount of attention to sort of the the um, the ethical implications of this, that um, I, I, I still worry whether or not uh, the amount of effort that we're putting into thinking through that um, is up to the scale of of the changes that are that are coming. The scale and the speed, in fact. Yeah, yeah it's a pretty fast pace. The AI is growing, right? So I'm not, yeah, right. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, at what point did someone decide to do a lobotomy? Would that be a good idea? <laughs> hmm. I'll give it a go. Yes. Again, this is one of, one of the joys of teaching non-majors neuroscience. You do neurohistory. And uh, just to give a little background, um, somewhere in the mid to late 1800s that people had perceived the brain as of, of course the, the seat of behavior and, and personality and everything. But they had also had a notion that the brain was very compartmentalized and it, you know, to some extent it is, but as it was pointed out by all of these uh, neuroscientists here, the brain is highly connected, okay? But they, they, I, I think it goes back to somewhere around the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was a, a a physician, um, Burkhart was the last name. And he had, a, he had a series of patients in an asylum, I think six or so, or half a dozen, or five, something like that, six or half a dozen. And uh, he uh, thought perhaps if he just tried to do a surgery and disconnect parts of the brain, that perhaps these deeply disturbed individuals would improve. Um, and for some number of patients that he had, some fraction, they didn't, some died, and some did, one appeared to improve because they became very docile. That sort of early history drove um, others to think about frontal lobotomies, um, and that became a practice somewhere in the 30s, I think, in Germany, I'm not sure where it began, but about the 30s is when the frontal lobotomy started. I think it was Antonio um, Egas Moniz who did the first set. I mean, if anybody else is on neurohistory stuff, they can correct me. Uh, but you know, it was this belief that the brain was this organic thing and it was broken. And so you took out the broken part. Um, and it was really dated back to these early trials on humans, um, something that we would not do today. Did that help answer the question? I hope so. I, I definitely learned something. I did not know that. Although we did know that, I guess there was a history of, you know, I mean, we still do lesion studies, right? Even in neuroscience yeah. today, yeah. because if we want to know how this brain part of the brain works, uh, well, cut it out and see what it doesn't do uh, as a, a for a rat, right? And so <laughs> there's there a long that. history of, uh, you know, trying to figure out what different yeah. parts of the brain do uh, and that, yeah. There is one one remaining example where, where such a surgery works, right? Which is epileptic surgeries. You can isolate a little, tiny little piece of the brain that is the core that's causing the, you know, the unusual activity patterns that then cause seizures. And it is possible to, to take those little chunks of brain out and people do pretty well after that. Yeah, absolutely. So, fortunately, uh, it's no longer <laughs> a huge piece of the brain, but you know, I guess it had, a, had an outcome in the long run. An interesting history. All right, so we'll take a final question uh, from the audience as we wrap this up uh, from Neeti. What is your story in science that led you uh, to your current interest in neuroscience? Um, should we start with Sarah? 
Sure. Um, yeah, so I think a little bit earlier I mentioned uh, this video, uh, something called the McGurk effect, but I didn't explain what it is. So I was in a neuropsychology class and, and saw this video, and it's it's a video of um, somebody saying the syllable ba, but they're mouthing the syllable ga. And what a lot of people hear is, is actually da. It's a completely different syllable. Um, and there's a couple of different versions of it. Um, and it blew my mind that like, this sort of realization that like what we experience the world is, is not actually a faithful copy of what is out in the world. It's actually like there's something in the world and then our brain is sort of taking in that information, you know, from our eyes where, you know, you get light information, it gets changed to electrical information. Your brain is also interpreting it. It's, it's literally filling in the blanks where it doesn't have information. And, and usually those guesses are right, but not always. Um, and so just this idea of like, what we're experiencing is, is, is also kind of a little trippy. Like the way we're experiencing is not necessarily exactly what's happening in the world. Um, and that just fascinated me. Um, it's something I still think about um, in the studies that I'm doing at Google, but just how, how much uh, there's a difference between how we experience the world and what's actually out there and just trying to understand that and how that can be so different from person to person um, and, and how that kind of, it, it impacts everything. It impacts how we think about ourselves, how we interact with the world. Um, just like how much is, is sort of happening from the way that our brain interprets things. Um, and so that kind of has always fascinated me and kind of has been a thread for me for, for all of my research. Tom, what brought you to science and what's your story? <laughs> what brought me to science? <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm, I, it's a very personal story. Um, my grandmother, um, she got her MD in 1912. Um, that was very rare in Germany. They had to flee Germany. But I grew up with this world of science um, uh, in the family and um, very broad in her thinking. I mean, she, that, that was the old school. She was both a scientist and a philosopher. She was a little bit of everything. And so from a very early age, I had this inculcated science from my grandmother. And uh, my parents never finished high school because of the war in Germany. But um, it still made it across the generations. And then neuroscience happened after I joined the faculty at the University of Washington. And it just was, I was interested in movement and I was immersed with people who studied the neural aspects. I was looking at the control or the forces and just collaborations brought me into the field. And a a Adrian was early on in that too. So I, I think as collaborators and, and really fun people to work with that brought me in. Great, uh, what about you, Aaron? Um, I don't know, I don't know if I could, if I, I don't know if I've thought about this before. I guess I, I have a distinct, distinct memory of, of, um, of being, in, uh, being in medical school and walking into an emergency room um, uh, and and talking to talking to a patient who was experiencing transient global amnesia, and um, and having the same conversation with that person over and over again, and then walking out doing some things and coming back in, and he was uh, back to normal. And I just thought this is um, this is amazing from uh, from a neuroscience standpoint, but it's also amazing um, from a human interaction standpoint of how, how do you treat someone with respect who. Who you know is um, is experiencing this thing in front of you, um, and how do you treat them respectfully as to who they are right now and who they might be twenty minutes from now? Um, so I think that's in part what sort of what sort of pulled pulled me in. Oh, cool! Thank you for sharing that. Tara, do you want to go next? Sure. Um... That's a good question. Um, I had, yeah, I've always loved science. I don't, I don't have a, a great reason why. I just always found it to be fascinating uh, growing up. But when I was in college, uh, I was working, I was one of, I think maybe, two, I'm sure Tom Frang would be able to remember. I think in the whole first neurobiology class, there was like maybe two of us that were not pre-med. And I was proud of that, that I was not pre-med. I was going to be, I was going to be a researcher and that was it. And you know, thank you very much. So I um, worked in different labs. I loved the labs that I was working in. I was um, working in, um, yeah, in several different places. And then I also worked in a clinic for children with autism and um, communication challenges just to make money. 
um, just because I needed a job and there was an opening and that's what I did. And after I went to graduate school and started my PhD program, I missed working in the clinic and it had not been part of the plan. So I asked my, my PhD advisor, what would you think about my applying to medical school uh, to transfer into the MD PhD program? And because I did not have enough forethought to take all of my pre-med classes um, during undergrad because I was not. Um, thankfully, the University of Rochester let me count some of my graduate um, courses uh, towards some of the standard pre-med courses and allowed me to um, take the MCATs and just uh, and, and apply in um, regardless. And my plan at that time was really only to do clinical research with children with autism and communication challenges. I did not plan to do clinical medicine um, and I just found them fascinating. And then Along the way, I just found that I've just never been able to quite give it up. Um, and I really love that work with patients. And so finding that for me, that intersection of where does science meet, pay, what are the, what's happening clinically um, really happened on sort of on accident uh, and retroactively probably increased it to near hundred um, percent from the first class that were pre-med, but it was not, not, not plan A at the time. Very cool. That's, that's a quick, great story to hear. Adrian, do you want to? Uh... Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I was another kid who always liked science. I mean, I liked lots of things, but science in particular, and the idea that you could use math, right, to understand things. And I, I going way back, it really was sort of biology, biological mathematics that that fascinated me of how soap bubbles and shells and waves and you know sort of pieces of the natural world that were that were more biological how they worked. I had a great lecture when I was in high school at a science summer school that I got to go to from um, Bob May, who was a, a physicist who'd gone into biology and worked on predator-prey interactions. And I was, he talked about chaos and that just blew me away. So I went toward chaos and nonlinear dynamics for my undergraduate and then graduate school. But fortunately during graduate school, I, as, I, as I told you earlier, when I was uh, in Israel, I started to go to talks in the brain building and I, I remembered the talk <laughs> that really kind of, okay, this is it, you know, it was about place cells. So place cells are cells in the hippocampus that fire when a rat is in a particular place. And that it was such a bizarrely amazing finding that there were, that were neuron cells in the brain that would have this very well-organized, well-defined behavior and then the conversation around it was so inspiring to me that the, the room was full of some physiologists, some psychologists, some computer scientists, some mathematicians having this uh, you know, multi-layered, respectful, thoughtful conversation where they were all bringing in different aspects of, of their own way of thinking about something. And for me, that was the moment where I said, oh, that is the science, that's the scientific intellectual environment I wanna live in where there's this fascinating problem and people can bring all kinds of different ways of talking and thinking about the problem to bear on understanding that something that really matters, right? The, how our brain works, it's just such a, a, a fundamental problem. So that after, after I graduated, then I, I shifted, you know, shifted gears and, and found, found a neuroscience group to move to. Great. Well, thank you all so much for sharing a lot of really personal stories as well as really insightful uh, answers and thoughts um, to all of the questions. And uh, to all of you, thank you very much. And I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you one and all for a truly electrifying discussion. Please give a virtual round of applause to the panelists and to all of our fantastic participants. A huge thank you as well to the planning committee for several months of hard work. We're humbled to be working with you and this event would not have been possible without each one of you. Because Gray Matters believes that everyone should be able to learn about neuroscience, our event will always be free to attend. That means we must rely on the supply on the support of noble donors to keep our event going. Every single person who's helped make this event possible has worked countless hours completely for free, and our funding goes solely toward material costs. 
We hope you'll consider contributing to Gray Matters to help us bring bright minds to neuroscience in the coming years at graymattersjournal.org slash donate. To learn more about Gray Matters, you can visit our website at graymattersjournal.org. Please also fill out our feedback form at tiny.cc slash EWN feedback. After all, this event is for you, and we want to know what you thought of it and how we can make it better for the future. As always, Chloe and I are truly inspired by the thoughts we've listened to today. They are reflective of the great cognitive and synergistic abilities of our own brains, as well as a shared belief that progress occurs best with discussion and understanding. Here's to a year of more neuroscience advances and opportunities. See you all next April for an evening with neuroscience 2022.